It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It means this guy and that guy, or that guy and this guy, are off the golf course and ready to do an exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! This week with special guest star, Mr. Ralph Murphy! Yeah, baby! <laughs> there he is. And welcome to the big Thank show. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Ralph and I literally got off a golf course about an hour and 15 minutes ago, so we're a little toasty. Um, yeah. But uh, as many of you know, oh, I should say a quick hello to the folks in the chat room. I've accidentally lost them. Uh, hello, Gloria, Amanda, Dean, Ken De Potter. Um, oops. Sorry, I want to get rid of that. Um, anyway, hello all of you guys in the chat room. Great to see you. Uh, so Ralph Murphy, for those of you who have not seen him on past episodes or have not met him at the Taxi Road Rally because he's there every year, he's long been, um, you know, a, a rock star of a speaker at the Road Rally. Um, he served as president, past president of NSAI, as well as VP of International and Domestic Membership uh, for ASCAP in, out of the Nashville office. You were there for 25 years or something? Yeah. 25 years at ASCAP. Uh, he's currently <laughs> consultant to ASCAP via his company, Mu uh, Murphy Music Consultant. Consulting. And I was not drinking beer in the golf course, just so you know. Uh, he wrote he this. He wanted to. No. He really wanted to. <laughs> anyway, Ralph wrote this amazing book, Murphy's Laws of Songwriting. Um, uh, many, many, many of our members have read it. Um, it's a national, international bestseller and is used as part of the curriculum at universities and colleges worldwide. Um, he's had hits with artists like James Royal, Jeannie C. Riley, Crystal Gale, Ronnie Millsap. He continues to write songs and get cuts all over the globe. And last night we were sitting at our kitchen table listening to, what was the young lady's name? Uh, Michaela Lynn. Michaela Lynn, listening to some stuff that Ralph co-wrote with her that was mind-blowingly good. So, uh, still doing it. Yeah, I've got a cut on the uh, Kid Rock album. Really? Which yeah. song? One that I know? Rain and Whiskey. Really? Yeah. It was It's on the charts right now. Unbelievable. <laughs> was that cut by somebody back in the 70s? That's or, or no, 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 no. What was the James Royal cut? Uh, that was uh, Call My Name. That's right. I confused name, rain, same yeah. false sound. Anyway. Whatever. Uh, well, that's cool. Yeah. So I'm having a good time. You are having a good time. We were having a good time on the golf course. He's the only person I can golf with that doesn't shame me for being as bad as I am. Um, anyway, so I'm going to get right to it as soon as I hold up. If you're watching the show for the first time and you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe. Um, like us on Facebook. Like us on YouTube. And share this episode with all of your friends. So there, I remembered, Bria. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get right to the question so that we don't spend a lot of time yammering up top. Uh, so the one question I get all the time from people is, is there any hope for songwriters nowadays? Because uh, it just feels like so many songwriters, um, our, our artists are also songwriters and producers are songwriters. And mm -hmm. is the day of the pure songwriter over or is there hope? Uh, basically, there were only two number ones uh, by uh, no, only one writer. In really? In tar well, tar but tar tar uh, so are you saying that the vast majority are co writes, but are yeah. they co writes with the artist and the producer primarily? Oh, <laughs> uh, a lot of cuts I get that uh, the artist is a participant in that and the producer is uh, a participant in that mm -hmm. so it's whatever whatever works for you 
Um, is that because uh, writers and producers have a tough time making money the old way, which is the, uh, I mean, artists, artists would get paid on album sales and mm -hmm. producers got paid on album sales and yeah. they don't anymore because album sales yeah. basically don't exist. There are no album sales. Right. So it, it, have they started participating in the songwriting because they're uh, desirous of participating or because they want to make the income stream? From? Well, uh, uh, streaming is uh, a negative thing. How so? Unfortunately. Um, streaming, uh, you can, uh, free is good. Everyone loves free. Right. So when you, uh, you get it for free, it's there's no need to pay for it right yeah, yeah. so so how does that affect people um uh, artists and producers because uh, as far as making them want to participate in the song right well um it's really important for uh the uh writer uh, sorry the artist and producer to participate simply because there are, uh, as you pointed out, there are no album sales. Right. Significant. That's uh, uh, yeah. really sad. Back in my day and, and your day when you, know, <laughs> you were um, producing, uh, you know, you'd get 2% of gross retail sales on a record yeah. for being the producer and probably little money up front. And that's like Also, <laughs> as a songwriter, uh, you were a participant in the uh, royalties the other, other nine songs or ten songs were dragged along by that one hit. Right. And you would sell uh, a million or two million uh, records. I, I had a cut on uh, Shania Twain's album that uh, sold, ultimately, sold seven million records. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a single. So you made money on the mechanicals because oh, you yeah. were on the album that yeah. the single drove the sales on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, remember Doug Minnick, who used to work here many years ago? Yeah. He, uh, one of my favorite all-time uh, taxi staffers. And Doug came up with the greatest phrase ever as digital started to come to uh, into fruition. Uh, Doug said they should come up with a thing called a percanical that's a hybrid <laughs> of a performance royalty and a mechanical. And I thought that was a great name because it really described what was needed. And, of course, now there are all these different ways um, that you can monetize stuff, but none of us, I, I, I'm, well, these guys may disagree, but I'm, I think I'm relatively <laughs> um, intelligent, maybe not the smartest guy in the sure. world, but you know, I, I catch on. Yeah. And, and things have gotten so complicated on how people get paid when something's on YouTube, um, when something's on Spotify, when something, you know, is playing in the grocery store, there are all these different ways. And frankly, as much as I try and stay on top of it, it's hard to follow, and we've had experts on the show that explain it, and frankly, when they explain it, it's hard to follow. Yeah. I, I get my statements from uh, UMG or uh, Sony or whatever, yeah. and it's so data, data, data. Yeah. And it's all for point uh, zero 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 nine of a cent. Yeah. And they have to, uh, uh, they have to uh, list all that, and uh, you it's know, it, just it, boring. It ad well, it's boring, but it adds up, mm. and it's the only way to make money. Pennies. Is, yeah, it's a penny business. <laughs> the old it's friend really of mine. reverted to a penny business. Totally. But it's, as somebody said to me about film and TV music, music library, uh, the industry itself, years ago friend of mine who's kind of the Clive Davis of that world said to me, it's a penny business, but if you do it right, those pennies really add up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so one thing, uh, that another thing that I hear all the time from <coughs> writers, I've been hearing this for 25 years, mm -hmm. which is, why is it that Taxi can't forward something that's pretty darn good and pretty close to being perfect, um, or not just taxi, but you know, why doesn't uh, a publisher, when they hear something that's pretty darn good, why don't they pitch it and let the the artist and the label and the other people uh, decide? Well, yeah, that that's pretty darn good. Yeah, you know, uh, why don't we just fix it up a little bit and it'll be fine? Why don't they take 
A minuses. They don't. I know they don't, but why? Yeah. <laughs> why? Because so much is involved. The um, IMF, the Inter uh, International uh, Federation of Music, uh, is it's cost two million dollars to promote a record uh, in a uh, real. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's two million dollars. Yeah. To break a record. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't uh, want to gamble on the A minuses no, because no. of that. Um, people get really upset with not just Taxi, but with other people in the industry. You know, it's like, but man, you said this was good. And we're trying to encourage them by saying no. it's good. But um, I get uh, demos from people all the time, and they're singing them. And they're not singing too well. If you, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, uh, if you have uh, uh, out of tune guitar time, uh, you, you, you're uh, festering or, and uh, as a producer because everything screams at you, stop it, stop it, yeah. don't do that. You've got to. And uh, it's just bizarre. I think that a lot of people worry that if people on the industry side are looking for something that is an A versus an A minus, that that bar is higher than, than yes. they're at, therefore they're excluded. But my answer to that is everybody else started out lower than that too, and they eventually yeah. got to that A. So but I would look at how they did it and do that. I never have recorded one of my own songs. I hire wonderful uh, people, wonderful singers, yeah. to sing it. I don't sing it myself. Also because it gives you a, an outside perspective on that song. Mm -hmm. You get to uh, see it really, really well. Um, the stuff that you played me the other night, or last mm -hmm. night, uh, the stuff from Michaela, um, was just literally a guitar vocal. Yeah, and uh, I know you guys are going to. But oh, she I, sings really well. She does, and, and, and the guitar part was executed really well. Yeah. You put the two together, and you could. It was like record quality, even though it was a demo, yeah. because both of those things came together so well. And you could imagine the records uh, coming forth from that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, frankly, um, both of those things in the state they were in under some circumstances would be licensable for film and TV even though they were yeah. just a guitar vocal because they were just so good. Um, one of the things that we hear all the time uh, from our friends in Nashville, uh, and I'm sure that you're a big proponent, I know you are, uh, <laughs> is visual detail. And, and we'll mention it in listings uh. and people go, well, what is visual detail? Uh, Ralph's going through his, he's got extensive notes. For those yeah. of you who don't know, Ralph does a study every year. Um, on the the top songs in the pop market and the top songs in the country market and looks for things that they have in common. So he's brought some of his notes and he's going to... Detail is so important simply because of uh, writer's uh, assumption. So let's talk about... For, let's define detail. Uh, detail? Yeah, uh, I mean... I guess you hadn't heard I was... Pedal to the metal on a downhill slide. Girl, you know those rumors get to flying in a town that size. No, I didn't feel a thing when you threw that ring and slammed the door. But if you want to know the truth, you got to go straight to the source. Ask any old bar stool. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's great. Let's just count the details in that section alone. Okay, pedal to the metal gives you a visual yeah. detail. The car's going fast. On, On downhill, downhill slide. slide. Yeah. Um, girl, you know those rumors get to flying in a town that size, so you automatically know it's yeah. a small town. Uh, no, I didn't feel a thing when you threw that ring and slammed the door. I mean, pretty <laughs> descriptive. Um, if you want to know the truth, go straight to the source. So, yeah, you're yeah. right. That, that's got, let's the see. The first four one, lines two. immediately lead to the title. Okay. The first four lines. It's called furniture. What's called furniture? Uh, detail. Ah, okay. It's furniture. So every uh, single song uh, reacts with uh, detail. 
Detail, detail, detail. And that's still the case in country, although pop, pop, not so much, the, right? Exactly the same thing. Really? The club, the club isn't the bass player. Oh, this is an Ed Sheeran song. The last one was yeah. Jason Aldean. This one's Ed Sheeran. Uh, the club isn't the best place to find a lover. So the bar is where I go. Me and my friends at the table doing shots drinking fast, and then we talk slow. Come on over and uh, start a, a, a conversation just with me, uh, with me, just with me. And trust me, I'll give you a chance now. I'll give it a chance now. Uh, take my hand, stop, put the man, van the man on the jukebox, and then we start to dance. dance. And now I'm singing like I'm in love with the shape of you. So, I've got a question. Every I, single uh, writer's assumption hurts when you uh, sit down and uh, that's why uh, generally the second verse is uh, redolent with uh, a detail. Why, what is, I know you've talked about writer's assumption mm. at many, many road rallies over the years. Is it appropriate for me to define it as the writer assumes that everybody else knows this because the writer knows it as well? Yeah. So they leave out the details because yeah. they've been in the room that smelled like a candle yeah. or they've been to the bar that smells like last yeah. week's cigarettes and beer. So Exactly the same. So how then do hit songwriters learn to craft such short, compact, not a syllable wasted, not a vowel or well, nothing is wasted, and they get all that detail in a line or two, whereas less experienced writers would take paragraphs or stanzas to, to accomplish the same You only quote. have 60 seconds because getting to the title is the object of the exercise, but uh, for, the writer... For both pop and country? <coughs> yeah. Okay, getting to exactly. the title. Exactly. Uh, um, Unfortunately, they got to, uh, hold on a sec. The fan. <laughs> Talk. Huh? No, no, the fan. Uh, whatever setting we chose this week, the fan's going crazy on the laptop. Huh? That's how it was. Probably, uh, Every single uh, song reflects uh, getting to the title in 60 seconds. Both in pop and country. Yeah. Why is it important to get to the title in 60 seconds? Don't bore us, get us to the chorus. Um, I wish more people would pay attention to that. We all know the phrase. It's been around yeah. for as, as long as modern music and songcraft has been, yet we hear it at Taxi all the time where people send in stuff with 35 second intros and then a double verse, and by the time you get to the chorus, you're a minute 45 into the song, and people wonder why we won't send that to hmm. you know a, a megastar in Nashville. Um, it's, you've got to, the first four lines set the um, groundwork for the rules, which uh, the hit or the hook uh, uh, follows on 60 seconds from you. Give or take, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be it exactly. People yeah. might take that literally, so pay attention to that. It could yeah. be 57, it could be 63. And the, uh, the two minute wall is very important. What's the two minute wall? The two minute wall uh, is either uh, a middle eight or um, an instrumental or a breakdown. It happens on average around two minutes and two minutes and 30 seconds. It's uh, people get bored. It's a long time to sit and uh, deal with uh, people uh, sound for two minutes. And they're itching to uh, uh, have, have you uh, go to right. a bridge. Right. And instrumental so, or whatever. And is it a fair statement to say that the bridge's job is to keep the listener engaged by introducing something new? Yeah. But what if I, I generally um, look at the uh, two-minute wall yeah. as what if? What? And if I'm uh, 
working in major chords, I go to minor in the uh, middle eight or bridge. And uh, if I'm working in minor key in the uh, bulk of the uh, verse and chorus, I go to major mm -hmm. in the thing, so. Um, got any advice on lyrics for bridges? If I were a songwriter, that would be where I would be most challenged, I believe. I, I use that, hey, I ask myself a question. I look so at the what if thing, okay. Yeah. So uh, can we what come up? this uh, hadn't happened? Okay, so taking yeah. a simple love yeah. theme song, a boy meets a girl, they fall in yeah. love, they go to the but lake and they if? swim. Right. Okay, that's great. It, it's it's so simple that people probably <coughs> overlook it. Yeah, you've got to you've got to uh, shift the view per perspective on the consumer or the listener. Many, many, many times you've said to me personally, uh, you've said it at the road rally, you've probably said it in every state in the union in several countries around the globe, <laughs> you've got to invite the listener in. And I'm sure that that's a function of visual detail and all these other aspects of craft. But I've had people walk up to me at the end of the road rally when, when you're on a plane going home already and they say, what exactly does he mean when he says invite the listener in? So can you elaborate on that? Um, and maybe the pronoun you is really important. Uh, on, on average, uh, there were 32 number ones on the country airplay and uh, seven on the pop charts. Yeah. And in general, there were a few um, songs that didn't use the pronoun you, uh, Body Like a Back Road didn't use the uh, pronoun you, but... Um, People love to point out the exceptions to prove oh, the yeah, theories wrong, yeah. but so you're saying that the vast majority do use the pronoun you. Yeah. And why Matter is that fact, valuable? Yeah. Um, have a 12-second twelve, twelve intro, reach the pronoun you in an average of 18 seconds, including uh, intro. The intro? Wow. Yeah. Use detail in describing the obj object of your affection or disdain. Uh, <laughs> if you're dealing with a guitar player, uh, then second form or third form if you want to beat radio up and fourth form if you're tending towards pop sensibilities. That's a pre-chorus yeah. verse, pre-chorus, chorus. Say, so which form is this? Fourth form. Okay, is there a name for fourth form? Um, or is it just typically called fourth form? Yeah, I, 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 I delineate uh, uh, names for the forms because I need to. Because so, uh, you're dealing with, uh, and uh, you're dealing with um, people who want to know, and they want to know, and... <laughs> you're talking about listeners want to know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or writers want to know. Oh. It's really important to writers. I, I just did a class uh, in um, ECCMAs uh, uh, in, uh, for uh, SOCAN yeah. in uh, Halifax, mm -hmm. Nova Scotia. Did you bring me some locks? No. <laughs> I didn't bring you any lobster <laughs> as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what was the class about? Um, a structure, and uh, they played me a lot of songs. And one of the things in pop, I found that they only use second form, which is a uh, rap form, and a fourth form, which is uh, a sophisticated pop uh, version. So, so only use two uh, structures, which is sad. It's really, really sad. Okay, so you're saying that those two structures are so primary uh, yeah. that if you del if you get out of the lane of those two structures, that you're yeah. hurting your chances of having a hit. Yeah. 
to which people are going to say, oh, Ralph, you're quoting all these statistics and you're telling me I need to get to the pronoun you in 18 seconds. <laughs> this is all so scientific and formulaic <laughs> that you're taking the muse out of my soul and my creation away from my writing. Get over it. Thank get you. over it. Um, I study all the number ones from last year, knowing that uh, it will be applied to the uh, 2018 crop. Right. It totally will. So, Have you seen any time period where there's been a bigger shift than other time periods in other words going from 2010 to 2011 or 12 or 2015 yeah. to 16 or 17 has there there been any um you know major tectonic shifts in, in the styles and forms that are used where you went wow that's really you know just dramatically different than <laughs> the staid forms that we've been used to over a period of time no um unfortunately uh, about uh, eight or ten years ago Ten years ago, and there were a lot of structures we used: mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, fourth form, uh, passenger used uh, sixth form. Really? Yeah. Uh, in which song do you remember? Uh, or let her go. Uh, let her go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what is sixth form exactly? Or sixth uh, form. You start with uh, the chorus, then a verse, then the chorus. I use it, it's a, a lot uh, available in uh, country or, or um, folk. Okay. And instrumental, middle eight or bridge, and then chorus, chorus, chorus till hell freezes over. Okay. Um, can you reiterate that uh, what sixth form is one more time? Yeah. Um, chorus, verse. No intro. Yeah. Well, uh, 12 second intro. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and is the intro a derivative of the chorus or of the verse generally? Well, no, it's generally uh, something else. Okay. All right. So, so 12 second intro and then yeah. jump into the first chorus. First chorus, then a verse, mm -hmm. which is a vestigial, which is uh, really so simple, and then a chorus, and then an instrumental or um, uh, a middle eight, yeah. and chorus, 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 till hell freezes over. So now that we're uh, in this example of sixth form mm. um, and talking about the repetition of the chorus at the end. I used that, actually, uh, in, uh, uh, with Silkan, um in last week. Um, so the, I have a question because in our world of film and TV, which is often um, somewhat different, if not very different from songwriting that would be used for radio and records, mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that probably 98% or greater of the songs end on a button ending, you know, come back to the, the, the root, end on a downbeat, bum, and just... So back in my How long day, would the... Uh, be how long? Uh, yeah. Well, it it could be an instrumental cue that is thirty, sixty, or ninety seconds ish long. Yeah. Um, sometimes they want instrumentals, which are different from instrumental cues, in that they're more like a song form and the length of yeah. the song. But the reason that they want stuff that ends on a button ending as opposed to a fade, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is, is in the world of film and TV, they don't want to fade because you can't end a scene yeah. on a fade. Um, so in sixth form, when you have that chorus that repeats over and over and over, do you fade it on the repetition, or you do you can, still go for the hard uh, ending? In most cases, the uh, dead end yeah. is used to piss off the uh, consumer, the listener. Okay. Because when <laughs> you de when you dead end it, it makes the uh, listener feel cheated, ah. and they want to hear it again. Leave them wanting more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, back in the day, uh, we do, used to uh, fade, use fades all the time. Right, and that was for the DJ to talk yeah. about it. And that was, you know, uh, James Royal, blah blah blah. Yeah. He'll be in town next yeah. month at the yeah. Starlight Ballroom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> well, I mean, it gave DJs 
back then DJs yeah, his were, yeah, but yeah. It, and, and that was their job was to make it interesting not yeah. only to have a- advertising in there but a DJ and his or her personality was part of the show yeah. now everything is just streamed and immediate and there is no longer show the music itself is yeah. purely the show um, and uh, basically uh, the um, uh, on average there were three four f- three minutes and 47 seconds long songs were yeah okay yeah. Uh, on average when back then and no uh, uh, this past year yeah three minutes and 47 seconds yep. okay uh, and that's true for country and pop. Mm-hmm. Are there any major differences between uh, the approach uh, of crafting a country song versus a pop song, or have they come closer than they ever have ever been? Actually, strangely enough, they, uh, the BPM of uh, country and pop were, on average, about 87 be- beats per minute. If you added them all together, and then uh, average them out. 87 BPM. Yeah, oh, okay. because people aren't dancing at 7 a.m. You, you, uh, <laughs> you uh, try to get a, a listener at work or in the automobile or uh, sit, sitting at, at a computer, mm-hmm. and it's 87, so it lifts them up but not so much. Um, okay, so mm. in pop music, it's very EDM, beat-driven, dancey. Yeah. Uh, the stuff that you hear on, on radio or on the charts, whether it's a, you know, a radio chart or a Spotify chart or whatever, um, the vast majority is pretty beat-driven. Yeah. Country... Um, uh, let me just say that many of the listings we get for country now yeah. say, and we'd like a little pop influence thrown in there. So we hear that yeah. coming from um, major Fourth labels. Fourth form. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, middle eight, or uh, the two-minute wall, observing the two-minute wall, and then chorus or pre-chorus and chorus and out. So... so are the people in country music sitting down and making a conscious decision that I need to write country that's more reflective and influenced by what pop artists are doing if I want to stay relevant? Yeah. Okay. Also, the language has uh, morphed a lot of... Uh, Give me some examples. You don't have to quote specific lyrics, but um, what do you mean? Um, well, there, uh, uh, B. Rexa and... Uh, Florida Georgia Line are really, really contemporary with uh, lyrics. Um, how does that fly in the face? Uh, for anybody who's never been to Nashville or really studied um, song craft, and, and, and there's a thing in Nashville. There, there's an old guard of people who are traditionalists, yeah. and there's a lot of craft. I mean, nobody can argue with the fact that Nashville's writers are the finest in the world in craft rules. It's yeah. like not people sitting down just waiting for the muse to accidentally deliver hit. These are people that live and breathe craft because- Well, you're driven uh, to uh, exert your craft. Well, it's, so uh, by them being important. so influenced by pop, do are the old guard folks in Nashville pissed off that pop has, um, you know, kind of pierce the wall. Uh, and, and, yeah, and very much so. Really? And uh, it's called bro country. Right. Yeah. But yeah, we get, it's so funny that you mentioned bro country because sometimes we get listings, um, not infrequently, we get listings from major label people or publishers in Nashville, and they specifically say, we don't want any bro country. Yeah. So, and, and these are from young people who I would, say are probably in their mid-30s. Is it because radio doesn't want to touch it? They've had it up to here with Bro Country, or well, why? it's interesting, the uh, Sam Hunt record, mm-hmm. he's from uh, Atlanta, yeah, which is a hip-hop uh, capital. Yeah, the hip-hop capital. And right. Yeah, and uh, Sam Hunt is, 
He writes a lot with Ashley Gorley and uh, Josh Osborne and Shane and uh, Shane McAnally and they do. Is Shane Mac's son? I don't know. I don't either, and I keep meaning to <laughs> Google that and find out. <laughs> anyway, mm. sorry. Uh, so he writes with all those people, Sam yeah. Hunt. And he, uh, the uh, inclusion of the pronoun you marks him as eccentric. Yeah. There were only uh, five songs that didn't use the pronoun you because uh, a, a song is not a song. It is a linear lyrical conversation between the artist and that you, mm -hmm. that listener. Uh, so you've got to invite the listener in. It's really, really important. For writers who are new in their career, mm -hmm. fairly early in their arc, and they're hearing this, they're going, wow, this guy's smart. He really knows what he's talking about. He's researched this, he's lived it, he's breathed it. He hangs out with the best in the business that do this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But that just all sounds like too many rules for me. I wanna just sit down and just create. Have um, a nice life. <laughs> uh, is it impossible to well, nothing's impossible, but uh, how how risky is it to work without craft as a songwriter? Well, uh, uh, around half a million to two million dollars is being spent on your project. Right. If you screw up too many times, you won't get another uh, cut at the uh, slice mm -hmm. of the whatever. <laughs> Save that for the, the the sequel book. You won't get another cut of the slice. Yeah. <laughs> Deep, Ralph. <laughs> Sorry. No, we all got it. We got it. Um, okay, are there any other pronouns other than you that have value in songwriting? What well, about she? Um, you were coaching my daughter, Hannah, probably 10 years ago yeah. on the... Uh, the suicide song. Remember, you were oh, up yeah. in our hotel room, yeah. and you said, Hannah, the whole thing's in first person. You need to make it about her over there so that we can visualize her. Um, and, and you made her change the me, 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 and yeah. I, I, I to her, 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 yeah. and she, she, she. The song was instantly 15% better. Yeah. And all of us sitting in the room instantly, even Hannah, who was resistant, as much yeah. as she loves you, she was clearly resistant. And afterwards, she gave you a little tip of the hat, like, that dude knows what he's talking about. Well, the important thing is to make the artist look like a winner. And why is that? Because you're no, you don't spend $2 million on a loser a script that makes your artist look like a loser. Okay, what about, I'm going to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. here, what about heartbreak songs? Um, isn't somebody a loser in that equation? Um, either the not, person... Not my artist. Okay, so the pronoun would be she. Yeah, uh, if you... If she you can't work. handle the breakup, so she's yeah. a loser. Yeah. But the artist singing it is not a loser. Yeah. Okay, so that's the... A the winner. Right. You've got to be a winner because they're going to uh, spend up to $2 million on that one single. And uh, no one will uh, take a script making the artist look like a loser. Right. I'm just scanning. Sorry for anybody watching uh, the show now or later. I'm scanning the the chat room to see if anything popped up re relative to any of that. Um, <laughs> Mojo Bone says, "See, that's what's wrong with today's country, right there. Nobody's in prison in a song anymore." <laughs> <laughs> I always love Mojo's perspective. <laughs> Peter Rahill says the Beatles uh, B-side, she's a loser. Um, she's a loser. 
Right. Yeah, yeah it, it's funny. Uh, <coughs> it's it's intimidating and somewhat overwhelming. Even for me, and I, you know, I mean, you and I have been close friends now for 25 years. And, I mean, when we're on a golf course and we're waiting for the other guys who are in front of us to tee off, we're sitting in a golf cart talking about this stuff. You yeah. know, we could be talking about our, our wives or our families, but this stuff always comes up. Yeah. And it's, that's what the meaning of love is. What, you and I in a golf cart? Yeah, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> love the music. Oh. I love the music. Uh, yeah, we share that. I mean, yeah. last night he played me these two songs sitting at our kitchen table at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, there, there are days where I don't love my job because it, it's a lot of pains in the butts to deal with. <coughs> but then I hear songs that are that well crafted. Uh, I said it on the 18th hole today. When yeah. I hear songs like that, I go, okay, this is why I'm in the music industry. This is what got me into it. This yeah. is why I'm still proud to be in it. Uh, but for young or just starting out songwriters, not uh, chronologically young necessarily. Uh, well, there's a, a misdirection in the song. Uh, they think that the artist wants to know all about them. Who, they don't. Who thinks that? Uh, the artist. The artist, the oh. new artist. Okay. Thinks, thinks that the public wants to yeah, know all about them. All about them. They don't. I know they what, don't care about them. What do they want to know about, Ralph? <laughs> My, uh, yourself as I see you. Yourself the as listener. I okay. It's so really the important. artists take on what, so that they feel that there's a relationship yeah. there. Yeah. Wow, they understand me. Oh, I under, I can relate to that. They're That's talking to me. Why, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, let's. Let's talk about a touchy subject, at least in today's um, sometimes overly political correct world, mm. uh, politically correct. Uh, let's talk about gender. You and I have had this discussion mm. in years past, um, and it sounds frankly a little sexist, not on your part, but just as a general statement, you know, to write songs that appeal uh. to women because women are the buyers or consumers, the primary consumers of music. Um, well, you've got to remember that the bulk of women, uh, women buy 50% of all records made and make men buy the other 50%. But nobody's buying records anymore. Well, they download it, listen to it, support Consume it. Consume it, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is it sexist to sit down and write a song and think, oh, I've got to write something that appeals to females because that's one of the rules of songwriting that will make my song more desirable? Um, well, there were 32 number one records on the country airplay charts. For which year? And for last year. 2017, okay. Yeah. And 27 of them were for males. Five, only five records were by women okay so what do women want to listen to men yeah why That's nothing against you guys because i am one but <laughs> <laughs> at least last time i checked um why is it that women that sounds really sexist um well, gloria steinem is having a heart attack right now why is it that women <laughs> want to listen to men well, because uh, women are the uh, bulk of the buyers of music. I know, but why do women, why are women attracted to songs where the, the artist is a male? Woman, women singing to women and men singing to women. Got All it. the time. All right. It's just uh, women are consumers. Makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to think of songs that appeal heavily to males which if you really think about it it's like metal there are certain forms of yeah. music that are probably pretty much a boys club which would be metal hard rock yeah. that kind of stuff um probably some forms of really extreme rap or hip-hop that's very you know yeah. of the street misogynistic. very misogynistic yeah. uh, to say the least it, it 
Well, they have a brand to protect, and also uh, it's the personalities who uh, attend the session who sing it. It's really important to them. Are we talking about hip hop? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, rap. Rap and hip hop. All right. Um, when country writers sit down to write, do they know the gender perspective rule? They know all. Uh, no. I mean, look, nobody sits down with a checklist of all these rules and goes, "Okay, my song needs no. to have a you know twelve second intro." Check, got it. My no. song needs to you know talk about you. And when I uh, take the uh, figures from the previous year, I use averages. Mm -hmm. uh, no one actually sits and on a 12 second intro or uh, it's 10 or 16 or right. whatever. It's the average of them. Uh, I, I try to think of myself uh, in, in the song as what's in it for the woman, what's in it for the woman, what's in it for the woman. If there's nothing in it for the woman, I, I don't uh, write it. Good job, Louise. <laughs> That's Ralph's wife. <laughs> yeah. I hope she's watching the show. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, so this is a really broad question. This is something I want to know, and, and I'm guessing that they probably would as well. If you had to say, you know, guys, here's the difference between a seasoned hit songwriter in Nashville um, or a seasoned hit songwriter in L.A. or New York or wherever that does pop. But right. he, these are the differences between seasoned hit songwriters and people yeah. who are still climbing the ladder, trying to become those people. What are some of the big differences that you see? Well, it's a time of day factor. Uh, someone who's singing for people at 10 o'clock at night or... 7 a.m. If you look at uh, Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. it's really 7 a.m. or uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night. Who people. they write for because that's their audience because yeah. they do a lot yeah. of live stuff. Yeah, and uh, they can infer a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, then at 7 a.m., you've got to uh, don't bore us, get us to the chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, you have 60 seconds to invite the listener in. So do the, the pro writers just know this stuff because they've heard it so many times and read so many books yeah. and written with so many other writers that it just becomes part of who they are? They yeah. don't actually sit down and try and craft to the formula so much no. as they just know that these are the rules that work. So why not Ashley go Gorley and Josh Osborne and uh, Shane McAnally and uh, all of them accidentally uh, stumble on the formula. So in a co-write situation, you got three pro mm -hmm. writers in the room, and do they have each other's backs in a co-write collab situation where somebody, uh, one of the writers says, why don't we, uh, let's try this line, and the other writer might say, it's a great line, but it won't work at 7 a.m. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yes, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, because um, I was writing with uh, a couple of people who remain unnamed. Um, there were professional writers, and they said uh, they were very exclusionary, and uh, one of them was a woman, and uh, she said, that won't work for women. So, uh, how'd the other writers uh, take to that? Were, okay. were they like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. good point. She's a successful uh, uh, songwriter and she's had uh, a couple of Grammys. Mm -hmm. And um, she was, what's in it for the woman? What's in it for the woman? What's in it for the woman? Interesting. Very, very important. I'm hearing voices of people 
you know, coming up with exceptions to the rule, but I always say about exceptions yeah. to the rule, I'd rather, if your goal is to be successful, whether you think of success as fame or income or the combination thereof, or just the personal satisfaction you get from seeing your songs or hearing them in all the right places, yeah. go with the rules of thumb, not with the exceptions, just because yeah. the exceptions make it easier for you. In a lot of cases, there uh, were albums done and back in the day, uh, 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, and uh, a song could break out of the uh, cover, uh, f um, cover version of that record. I don't understand. Well, uh, there were a lot of uh, covers done yeah. back in the day. Right. And uh, they assumed um, <laughs> that the uh, write, writer, wrote, writer wrote them. Ah, okay. They assumed not the case. Um, do you find that older writers who have been around and had, uh, I see this with uh, potential taxi members who have, we get people that call here you know, several times a year and they're somewhat famous. Uh, maybe they're not famous, but they've been very successful as a songwriter. They've been successful in some aspect of the music industry, and now they're going to join Taxi. The mm -hmm. reason that I believe they're joining Taxi is because they've run out of mojo. Um, yeah. Their career ha has stalled, and they've tried stuff on their own, and they go, well, maybe I'll try that Taxi thing. Yeah. But then they come to us with... Uh, Unrealistic expectations. Right, because they've had hits in the past. Well, yeah. okay, but that hit was twenty, or those string of that string of hits was twenty-five years ago. Yeah, and I will personally get on the phone and discourage them because they're going to be disappointed with us yeah. because we can't magically make the industry like what it liked about them twenty-five years ago. Yeah, as much as I would love to do that for somebody. So Nashville is just rife with hundreds what, of those writers. What I found is that unfortunately uh, hanging time is important to uh, the songwriter. Where do you go? Listening room, uh, Douglas Corner, uh, Commodore, whatever, Bluebird. Do you listen to uh, writers at 6 o'clock, 6 to 7.30 or 8? Because uh, what you bring to the uh, equation, the dance, Hmm. is uh, your structure, vocabulary. And only thing that changes is from uh, year to year is vocabulary and technology. Hmm. That's all that changes. The structure remains the same. And you always have to uh, wind up at the uh, title within 60 seconds, uh, minutia and detail at the front uh, part of the song is really, really incredible. And it's like the pronoun you inviting the listener in. There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, if you want to have a, a, country, uh, a, a record on the country airplay charts, have a 12 second intro, reach the pronoun you in an average of 18 seconds, use the T detail in describing the object of your affection, disdain. If you're dealing with a guitar play, player, second form, third form if you want to beat radio up, and fourth form, form uh, tending towards pop sensibilities. Hit the title within 49 seconds. Uh, stay around 88 beats per minute. Uh, and dead end the song. And that gender thing, I wouldn't touch at all. Okay. Um, really interesting that you mentioned technology and vocabulary, the mm. only two things that change. Yeah. I completely understand that and agree with you. Let's talk about technology. Um, country songwriting is so much about craft yeah. Yet pop is so much about the producer. I mean, nowadays, you know, you have eight writers on a song and seven of them yeah. are guys who, you know, one guy did the hi-hat, one guy did the kick drum, somebody else d did the snare drum. I mean, I'm exaggerating <coughs> a little bit, but trying to make a point, which is pop is very technology dependent. 
yeah. the stuff <clears throat> you played me last night, there, there's nobody that wouldn't listen to that and go, this is great. Yeah. And it's nothing but a guitar and a vocal. So it has virtually no. nothing to do with technology other than that young lady did it herself. Yeah. Um, at least some uh, of it. And uh, I think she had uh, Logic or Pro Tools in the bedroom and stacked all the guitar parts and the harmonies as well. Mm -hmm. So, Which is not uncommon, you know. Yeah. I mean, a lot Most of people, people yeah. have uh, Logic or Pro Tools in uh, a spare room or whatever. So, um, But the difference is that a pop song, you can hear a beat, you can hear a track and go, yeah. that's an attractive track. It's got a great rhythm, it's got a you know, great yeah. beat. Um, uh, and then somebody else comes in and does top line on it. Yeah. And whereas in country, <coughs> it seems that the it, song is written before them. Yeah. Yeah. So, any interesting observations um, about that stuff from you? Because it's clearly one is the cart before the horse, and the other one is yeah. the horse before the cart, yeah. and yet the result is that they both land, you know, create hits. It's really important for the uh, person going to Nashville to learn the guitar or keyboards. Which, uh, do you have a preference or, or one that you think well, will give them any uh, sort of a guitar is more pro portable. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it more likely to get your song cut if you've presented a guitar-based demo versus a keyboard? Yeah. Based demo? Okay. Good to know. That's really good to know. Um, and is it a fair... Unless it, it's a ballad. Because... Um, yeah. Ballads can be done well on a keyboard. Yeah. Okay, let's Wonderful. talk about ballads because that is, is often. I'm, I know this from going to Nashville so many times, and I think everybody in Nashville certainly knows this. A ballad is nearly impossible to get yeah. cut. It yeah. doesn't matter if it's the greatest ballad in the world. Why is it that songs that are up tempo will get cut faster than a ballad? Well, it's. Uh Seven in the morning. How how you, how do you listen to stuff in the car at seven in the morning? You want to be uh, waking up, right? You what, want the audio caffeine up. versus so, uh, yeah. a sleeping pill. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of logical. Yeah, people don't think about it though. Yeah, you've got to you've got to think about the listener all the time. That's true in writing a novel, yeah. creating a film. You have to create yeah. for your audience. Not, I think it was John Brahaney years ago, many years ago, like 26 years ago when I was starting this company. Brahaney and I were sitting at a booth at Jerry's Deli or somewhere, and he referred to the Maya Angelou quote, which I can't remember now, but it was something <laughs> along the lines of, you know, don't create for you, create for your audience. And yeah. one of the great adages of marketing that's been around since the 30s um, is what's in it for me. Yeah. Every time I sit down to do any marketing stuff for taxi, I always have to look at it when it's pretty much done and go, did I answer the what's in it for the reader? Yeah. Not for me, because yeah. I'm not trying to sell me anything. I don't I, care. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that makes me so effective, I'm not being political, politically correct. You personally, as a writer, no, you mean? I I don't care. Uh, <laughs> when I, when I write some songs, uh, I know they're only for, for me. Right. Uh, when I write for the great. Uh, <laughs> people uh, out there yeah people out there yeah uh, I, I think about that the, as a, a script because it's connecting to the listener or uh, to the listener from the artist it's really important uh, who's our mutual friend I'm drawing a total blank of his name he wrote future hit DNA years ago Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. J. Frank? J. Frank, yeah. Um, totally off topic. Sorry, guys. We have a little personal discussion. Where is Jay? Didn't he just get a new job recently? Yeah. Where, um, he was VP of CMT, Country Music Television, yeah. years ago. 
And then he went solo. He started a record label called Dig Dig Sin, I think, or Dig Spin, yeah. something like that. Dig Sin. Okay, and now yeah. he's doing. He's uh, 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 on a, a course of uh, marketing. Okay. Digital marketing. Um, all right, I want to open questions up for you guys. I'll hit Ralph with one more thing. Bria, do you have some already? Okay, so you guys pop up your questions. Bria will take some down and hand them over to us. Um, and I want to ask you one more thing, which we touched on at the very top of the show, um, but I want to elaborate a little bit more, and that is I think the bar has been raised for what is expected with a vocal now uh, on a demo. Um, it used to be that you could submit, people want to know why can't I just submit a great song with a, you know, yeah. stripped down with a guitar vocal and you played me some last night that were spectacularly good. Yeah. Um, Depends uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the writer. So I would make the case sometimes that you get somebody who, uh, like a Willie Nelson-esque delivery <laughs> that, that, right, that, you know. It's if, 10 o'clock at night. Um, but they, but sometimes the songwriter, even though they technically don't have great vocal chops, mm. they are able to convey the emotion so well for their song. They might be a little pitchy, but the emotion is there. There are other times that I would make the case for, you want the best friggin' vocal you can get on that yeah. thing because you want the artist at the label to hear it and go, I can do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's why... I also write with the artist as well. Which brings us to something we talked about uh, at some point last night or this morning on the way to the golf course, which is writer's camps that you want to get yeah. in. And that's not an exactly new phenomenon, but it's become much more prevalent than it was 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, um, a publisher, a, a new a uh, really hot publisher, only signed uh, four producers to uh, long-term contracts. They they only felt uh, they were worthy and it was really important to them. To the publisher? Yeah. So are you saying that publishers generally don't sign songwriters anymore, that they want no. producers? Yeah. And are those producers also writers? Or uh, back in my day, a producer was a guy who probably could sit behind a console, who could watch the budget of um, a record and was able to say, you know, we need to bring in somebody to play sax. I know a good sax player. And yeah. yes, that's a good performance on the sax. So a producer to a record was probably somewhat more akin to the director of a movie back in my day. Now it's morphed into a producer could a participant. Be some, <laughs> participant, I love that. Um, somebody who just cooks up a good beat on, you know, on, with drum software can be a producer now. Yeah. Um, that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> but um, lyrically, um, uh, a lot of songs uh, like Gangnam Style. Yeah. Which no one knew what he was saying. Right, Gangnam Style, but it was all we about still coffee. Care. Yeah, really, I yeah. had no idea. Uh, if you read the lyrics, uh, and it was hugely, it was Gangnam Style was uh, about coffee, <laughs> heart rate. Okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sugar and uh, caffeine uh, blend together to. Uh, so. How, how does that relate to the role, the new role of the producer? Well, I don't think it does. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. It was a tangential thought. Got it. Um, yeah, uh, is that true? In you know, in country, you had legendary producers. Um, yeah. That. Uh, big artists would hire these guys because they have the producer had a sound and a style and knew how to evoke the best performance from the artists that they worked they with. They developed uh, studios that yeah. they worked in. Right. And Woodland and uh, 
Clement B, uh, Jack Clement uh, B, and A, and there was a whole bunch of studios that have gone out of business. Yeah. Because uh, they can do uh, the tracks in their their bedroom on a laptop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 it's sad but true. Um, you know, the, the last room that I worked in was about a $3 million room, and that was a room I spent five years working in. Yeah. And I could do stuff much faster, much better on my laptop now. Yeah. Although, sad but true. Nothing like sitting behind 13 feet of SSL. There's something really. <laughs> and auto tune. You can yeah. auto tune that human animal to make them sound really good. I have a question about the stuff you played me last night, which I wish I could play for you guys, but it's not something that we could put out in the public purview right now. But um, are demos like that guitar vocal demo that Michaela did, would she auto-tune that stuff? Um, no. Or are her vocals that good that she didn't need to? No. Most uh, artists uh, need to be auto-tuned. Yeah when they're making the records. What like about demos? Not so much. Them. Thank you. A lot of them. A lot of demos yeah. are auto-tuned? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Paul, Paulie asks, um, is the ballad dead like the dodo? In other words, extinct. It depends if the artist writes it. If the artist wants to go with a ballad, and third person, you roll with that. Right. It's all about getting artist acceptance. Okay, so is the artist going to do... Are they going to cut it? Yeah. Is the artist going to do his or her career? Um, I don't it, care. <laughs> if they come out with a ballad because the yeah. public doesn't want it? Yeah. Okay. Um... Marion Laird wants to know, is there any hope for the return of bluegrass? And I know how to answer that, but I want to hear your take on yeah, it. Yeah, uh, probably about 10 o'clock at night. And um, CDs uh, of bluegrass populate my world. And I love it, and I love writing it. It's so easy to write because it's just so obvious. And it's 10 o'clock at night. You when love people it. listen to it, okay. Yeah. Um, it makes you feel special. Who's the gentleman? I can't think of his name. Uh, oh, Cheryl. Um, uh, you Cheryl introdu Blackman. Yeah, you yeah. introduced me to him sitting in the famous Ralph Murphy <coughs> Harlan Howard booth uh, at the Sunset. Uh, yeah. And Cheryl and I uh, were talking about three, four months ago, and he told me that his work as a song plugger has largely gone over to bluegrass now. Yeah. That he's just killing it in bluegrass, so there's clearly a market out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you can uh, get accounted for, uh, if you can get the money from that, well, good luck on getting the money from that. What do you mean, from like? There are small, small labels Ah. and that uh, don't account for to royalties for uh, song written song written song writer songs okay so while the bluegrass market is happening it's very localized and regionalized yeah. and it's kind of like country back in the day and, exactly. and probably not unlike um, Latin music today which is extremely you know to this day yeah. Latin music is very localized and regionalized um, Justin wants to know, will more traditional country music make any form of a comeback? It depends. Um, I've got a song on the uh, Kid Rock album, and maybe in a different form. Okay. Rain and Whiskey is uh, uh, my cut on it. And was that something that you did back in the day? That, yeah. That Kid Rock heard it and went... Yeah. I got a cooler idea, a more yeah. modern idea, a different take on this. Yeah. All right. Um, but then it's not really traditional country anymore. It's a song that was traditional country 
at the time it came out, yeah. the Kid Rock detraditionalized it. Well, kind of. Yeah. He just celebrated his uh, country roots. Okay. I thought he was from Detroit. Yeah, well, Detroit. Harlan Howard was from Detroit. Really? Yeah, from uh, Michigan. Harlan Howard. Just, uh, tell him who Harlan was. Ralph, Ralph, is it a fair uh, statement to say there's nobody who's had a bigger influence on your life than Harlan Tiger, Howard? Tiger, yeah. He was my dear friend. Uh, uh, Tiger by, by the tail. You walk by and I fall to pieces. <laughs> he... Uh, Great song. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his, I, I was looking, uh, actually when I wrote the email they sent out about today's show and I referenced Harlan, I, I, I think I linked to his Wikipedia um, so yeah. people could have some context. The, the number of cuts that guy <coughs> had, phenomenal. And, and just for those of you who don't know this about Ralph, that Ralph and Harlan had a, regular, had a booth at the Sunset Grill in Nashville mm. and yeah. they were famous for always being in that booth together. Um, so. You were the recipient of a lifetime of, of songwriting knowledge from one of the true greats. Yeah. Lucky you. Yeah. Um, any are chord changes? Uh, Lamar wants to know: Are chord changes gone for now? Chord changes. First of all, you never change your chord until you uh, change your thought. That's a. I love you, great and I, if we would make it, I would. Be the one. Change your chord when you change your thought. That's kind of like changing underwear. I know there's an allergy in there. But <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, change linear. your chord when you change your thought. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Right. It's so obvious. Sometimes obvious stuff is overlooked. <laughs> um, Ken wants to know, can Ralph discuss contemporary country pop instrumentation? Is it any different than it was 10 plus years ago? Yes, it is. So because uh, the steel guitar is probably non-existent. Wow. Yeah. I, I went round uh, Country Music Association last year and uh, all the acts, I didn't hear one using uh, 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 pedal steel. Um, that's sad for the pedal steel guys who are incredible craftspeople because yeah. pedal steel is really, really hard to play. Yeah, it is. But uh, no, no more. Yeah, it's, anybody that would use it now would probably sample it anyway, mm. sadly. Um, yeah. Probably. Okay, any other observations on instrumentation that's changed? Um, um, what about real drums versus drum machines in country music? Ooh. I know, I know. I'm just I'm, Let's say, pretend I'm asking that rhetorically. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I miss the drummer, the real drummer. Yeah. Uh, going out for a beer after the session's over because they're crazy. <laughs> I love them all, but they're all crazy. So when records are made in Nashville, are they programming drums now like they would on a pop record? Yeah. It's not a room full of, yeah. of guys coming in and laying down a track in an hour? Is that, well, does that still happen? It still happens. Um, I, I did it uh, probably in about 15 minutes in real world. I, I got uh, Kenny Malone and Thumper. We call him Thumper. Uh, Chris Lissinger um, and Dave Pomeroy and it was so miraculous what was how fast the, the yeah. track came together and probably in about 15 minutes they played it one time and then they played it again and that was the track um, which is typical for Nashville yeah. because players are that good uh, any other questions? Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, sure. <coughs> All right. Um, Polly wants to know, during a tax road, taxi road rally presentation, you said in Nashville they speak the language. You're not going fishing. You are going riding. Know the differences. Can you expand on that? Well, 
Um, I had to learn, I, I had uh, accidentally had a country hit in 1971 and went down to uh, uh, Nashville in 1972 for the awards with Jeannie C. Riley. And I thought it would be really easy to uh, uh, commute there and <laughs> not so much. Right. I had to physically move there and learn to speak the language uh, because uh, I realized that if Don Williams was talking to an audience, uh, they, they wouldn't understand my way of speaking because I'm, uh, I'm a linguist and I'm English. So they wouldn't... So you had to learn the vernacular of the industry, yeah. of that part of the industry. Yeah. The vocabulary, uh, vocabulary of the uh, artist. Uh, and every monosyllabic is... Hey, don't make fun of them. I love monosyllabics. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. But um, whale, well, isn't whale. Right. It's whale. <laughs> right. <laughs> this isn't this. It's theus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I know friend, you're right. It's still funny. <laughs> well, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Carl Perkins, uh, uh, was really proud of the Beatle cuts yeah. and the way they uh, formed the language around that uh, colloquialism. The way the Beatles did? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Matchbox and, yeah. and uh, a whole bunch of songs. So they successfully... Um, uh, translated it from yeah. Nashville colloquialisms, yeah. which is a really hard word for me to say, uh, <laughs> into uh, Britpop. Well, yeah, it, they uh, adopted what they uh, heard on the records to accommodate them. It was really cool. Uh, speaking of commuting to Nashville. Yeah. Um, there are very few people that I can point to. Um, oh gosh, I can't think of his name now. <laughs> anyway, there there are a few that I know that commute to Nashville so frequently that people are surprised to find out they don't live there because they've become fixtures. Um, and I just can't think of the gentleman's name right now. But so many people think, okay, I'm going to move to Nashville because it's this happening music scene. Yeah. And they get off the figurative bus, as it were, and they just hmm. say, hey, I'm new in Nashville. And they think they're going to set the town on fire um, because I'm awesome. And Bring they're awesome. what they uh, presuppose the audience wants. Right, and, yeah. and and Nashville people think, oh man, you know, they really put you through the ringer down there. They make you pay your dues for five years, and they think it's some sort of prescription that you have to pay your dues for five years. They don't understand. It's not just an arbitrary rule. It yeah. just takes that long yeah. to to hang out in the right places, and yeah. it's not a matter of hanging out in the right places just because you were seen there. It's what you hear there and learn yeah. and absorb and you meet other writers and network and you become woven into the fabric of what Nashville is. It's not that they're trying to keep you out because you're an outsider. They just need you to get caught up to them so that yeah. they can respect you enough to work with you. Is that all a and fair statement? Hang, hang out at the uh, listening room, whatever, um, Bluebird. Douglas uh, Corner. Yeah. yeah, Douglas Corner. And hang with... Uh, the new writers, yeah, not uh, nine o'clock to midnight uh, or uh, eleven o'clock, is the old dog writers. Why would you recommend? Uh, I'm, I'm asking this for the people well, watching that would think I want to hang out with the Ralph Murphys, the old nah. dog songwriters, because they're established and they're going. I'm going to ride their coattails in. I'm looking for the uh, six o'clock to eight o'clock. Uh, writers. Why would you because want to hang with the new writers? They have the new vocabulary, which right. will be eminent on uh, next year's charts. And so, how do the older, old school writers feel about the new up and comers? I know this is an age old question in Nashville and an age old 
problem is the guys who get, hey, man, I've had a bunch of hits. Well, now you're irrelevant. And they've become irrelevant yeah. because they're not listening to what works in today's you're market. You're not listening at all. So why don't they just get off their butts and listen? And, and It's difficult. Yeah. You get uh, uh, locked into a role that you play as the old dog, and you're not aware of the nuances that new people uh, uh, bring with them. That's a really good observation, and it's sad. It breaks my heart when I run into people who had a bunch of hits back in the day, and they, they don't see that they're irrelevant. Um, and, and you don't want to label them as being irrelevant. You know, I'm a cheerleader yeah. for them. I want them to become relevant again. And all they really have to do is pay attention and listen. Yeah. I stay relevant uh, by going to uh, clubs and hanging out. I'm home by most nights, 10 o'clock mm -hmm. at night. Uh, only... Uh, uh, Louise, text me and tell me if that's true, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I try to get home uh, by 9 or 10 o'clock at night because all the new people are at 6 o'clock. Yeah. And they love, love when I go to them because they feel they're accepted by the old guard. Right. Yeah. And really what you're doing is learning from them and networking into their... I'm, I mean, I was so impressed with the stuff I listened to that you did with Michaela last night. Yeah. This is a 16-year-old girl Yeah, that has been doing this stuff since she was 13, and you instantly know when you hear it, you go, okay, this person is laser-focused. Nothing else in her world yeah. exists other than Songcraft. Yeah. That's all she cares about. Oh, mention how many shows, for what period of time she was in Nashville, and how many shows she hooked up on her own without a manager or a booker? Every day she was in Nashville. And she was in uh, Nashville for 12 days, and she had 12 shows. And good shows, not in yeah. garbage places. Yeah. And she pulled this off as a 16-year-old yeah. without a booker or a manager. Yeah. I don't know how that's possible, frankly. I found it hard to believe. Not that I thought you were lying right. or exaggerating about it, but it's like I can't even imagine what she did. Well, her to mother do that. is uh, very pushy. <laughs> oh, she's got a momager. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's not like. But that. he loves you, mom. Yeah. <laughs> but he's. Uh, <laughs> She's got a momager because she doesn't ha have any a way to uh, attract a, a manager in the real world. I would think that she'd be extremely able to attract a manager because she's, you know, managers don't want you until you've already accomplished yeah. what a man, what you would hire a manager to do. That's when they want to come on board with you. Yeah. It seems like she's got it. I mean, she she's writing with real writers. She's coming up with yeah. killer material. Yeah. And she's booking 12 shows in 12 days as an, yeah. somebody who doesn't even live in Nashville. Well, she's a freak she's, uh, in a good way. She's been coming down uh, probably every three or four months yeah. on a regular basis and every uh, incrementally when she uh, co-writes with an artist uh, uh, another artist or writer hears about her so I've, I've uh, bragged on her forever so when you write with somebody who's 16 years old oh yeah and do you get they the bring, they well, bring the vocabulary, I bring the structure. So I would think that being a fly on the wall in that room yeah. watching that writing session, um, that the inclination would be for the old dog that knows all the tricks, meaning you, to bend the young person to their will. Yeah. But you're smart enough to get out yeah. of the way because you know the drill because you've been doing this yeah. for so long. So you get out of the way and you learn from her. Yeah, and every year uh, there were 32 uh, number ones. I don't understand a lot of the uh, things they talk about. Yeah. I just, I'm confused by that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why uh, I read them and I ask 
questions about them, I, I'll ask uh, uh, some hit songwriters who are much uh, younger than me. Yeah. And I will say, what does that mean? And she'll go, oh, the blah, blah, blah. Or he'll go, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I feel so educated by youth. Wow. Good for you for um, opening up your your mind to that because a lot of the older writers I know are just sticking with what they did that made them successful and they're not moving off yeah. that mark at all. Um, so Jim Precop asks, uh, and this is, ooh, we're almost at the end of the show, uh, asks, are the forms and structures of songwriting <coughs> and the Nashville song crafting methods discussed today in your book? Yes. <laughs> but Priya's holding up sign show book or give a do book yeah. giveaway. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, I was actually privileged to be one of the people that read this book before it went into print. And yes, it, it's the beauty of this book is that it's Ralph talking to you about all the. It's like hanging out in the booth with you and Harlan. Yeah. It's all the stuff that you've learned from all these people over the years, yeah. and then applying it in today's world. Yeah. So it, it's not a typical song craft book, as it were. No. Um, it, it's anecdotal. It's what what makes hits? Yeah. That's really important. And we will give one of these away in a couple of minutes. Um, any final thoughts um, other than my golf game was just absolutely <laughs> abhorrent today? Um, man, that first hole, was it the first hole? Which one? Uh, there was one early that was just terrible. And then I had another one somewhere around 14 where I just wanted to like pick up my ball and go home. <laughs> I did have some moments, but he was, Ralph yeah. was consistent today. He was, he uh, had very few bad shots. He was consistently good. Um, we do this <laughs> once a year we get together. Uh, this year is only for one day because I had to go to a wedding yesterday. Um, and Eric from our staff actually went as Ralph's golf buddy yesterday. Um, so thank you, Eric, for doing that. And yes. uh, thank you. Yeah. And Ralph and I, um, it's our annual bro date, if you will, he stays at our house and we go out and golf together. And it's fun because we talk about life and love and yeah. uh, children and grandchildren and songwriters. All the realities of our world. Yeah, which is pretty narrow in scope, yeah. but we share. Unfortunately. <laughs> we share them intensely. Um, so with that, uh, Bria, can you handle the book giveaway? I'd uh, do a floating finger and bingo. So here's what we're going to do. Um, Mojo Bone says he wished more executives bold. I think they do, but they just don't talk about it a lot. Um, <laughs> Uh, James Carvalho says he needs a new driver. Oh, just call Uber. Um, <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. All right, uh, Bria uh, is going to do the the finger flying finger of fate on the the chat room. Um, you're well welcome, Martin. Um, and what you guys need to do is type in a plus one, and Bria is going to shut her eyes and go bingo, and whoever her finger lands on um, is going to get this here book <laughs> did that my best Nashville this here book and go <coughs> plus ones oh and if you don't win the link to go buy the book is in the description if you don't win the link to buy the book is in the description below the video on YouTube and Bria's going to pick out, look at that, all those plus ones. Wow. All right, uh, Ricky Archuleta. Ricky Archuleta. Yay. You are today's big winner. Well done, man. Yes, congratulations. I'll see you on the charts. Uh, uh, and Ralph will autograph this to you. Um, hey, Ricky momentarily yeah, sure um ralph the, it's like having uh, you know what this is like having you here with me not just on the show but staying in our house and going golfing and everything you're like the one relative i want to actually <laughs> hang out with you know everybody's got the one cool cousin that they love he's my cool cousin I, we're not actually related but we might as well be we've known each other now for 
25 years? Scary. Yeah, it is. I was I having hits back then. <laughs> Uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend at the Four Seasons Hotel. You were yeah. sitting there with Todd Brabeck having a beer and talking about... Lenny you. Calico. Uh, Lenny Calico yeah. walked me up to the table and said, you need to know this guy, Ralph Meet Michael Lasko. He started this new thing called Taxi. And Ralph, being the gentleman that he was, rather than turning his nose up going, ooh, like so many other people did at the time, Ralph actually paid attention and listened carefully, not in that moment because he was busy negotiating his... Uh, soon to be a rival at ASCAP, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so really bad timing on Lenny's part, but that it never stopped Lenny, right? <laughs> we Ain't love you, Lenny. Truth. Anyway, we've been friends ever since, and our friendship has only grown deeper and better. And I really appreciate you coming out to do the show. Oh, okay. and, and the golf was awesome. And my pleasure. I'm heartbroken that we can't do another round tomorrow, but uh, you know what? Hey. Uh, maybe we've got some Ooh. things in the wind that will keep me coming, uh, have me coming down to Nashville yeah. in the next few weeks. Yeah. We can do. I've never played golf with you in Nashville. Ah. So with that, I bid you guys adieu, Ralph. I bid you adieu. And you be well. Uh, see you next week for another exciting episode of Tao. No, next week we're off. We're on hiatus next week, right? We're off next week. We'll be back on the 21st for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah, baby.